Good morning, church. I want to tell you that I really miss seeing all of you. I hope that you're all staying safe and keeping well. And I just want to welcome you to our live stream service this day. A few announcements I want to share with you this morning. Uh, of course, I'm sure most of you know that the conference has decided there'll be no camp meeting this year. It'll be virtual and uh, it'll be live stream but uh, we will be going to Gladstone camp meeting this summer uh, also next Sabbath I'm sure you understand that uh, our large and exciting communion service on Ashland in the afternoon of course has been cancelled and uh, I also want to say that next Sabbath is Easter Sabbath and Eurydice has agreed to preach a, a sermon on something pertaining to Easter and the wonderful weekend that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Um, he said he's going to slow down, going to talk slower because some of you have a hard time hearing him, especially when it's live stream and you don't get to see him in person. Uh, just pray for him. He's uh, he's doing so much better with his English, and don't uh, don't get discouraged. Uh, we're all learning. I always find that those who have an accent you actually listen and pay closer attention to, and your mind doesn't wander as much. So that's a, there's positive things about that. Uh, I'm excited that, that the school, RVAA, is continuing uh, online. The teachers are meeting with their, teach, with their students online and giving them assignments, and, and things are moving right along with our school here. Um, I spent some time, and the elders have spent some time calling different ones, especially uh, the elderly, uh, they're they're lonely out there, so take some time and call one another. Keep in connection with one another. Um, the young people, man, I want to tell you, young people, I I miss you. If you're listening, you're watching out there, I miss you. And uh, and you know, I can't think of anything that probably bring more joy than for a young person to call an elderly person and and tell them hello and that you're thinking of them. So take time, do that. Think of others. Think. And all of us, think of others, of who we can contact and encourage and, and lift up their spirits during this time when we're all hunkered down and hiding from each other. Um, we seem to have a problem coming up. It doesn't look too good. Uh, conference has done some things to help make it more secure, and that's with Zoom. Uh, Zoom has given us some, some issues out there. We've had some warnings out there that people are hacking in right in the middle of the presentations in your meetings while you're using Zoom. And uh, the conference has actually uh, worked together in a much more uh, higher security uh, process called Teams. And so I'll be communicating with you. We may be happy to switch over to Teams uh, for our different uh, meetings, elders meetings, board meetings, where it'd be a little more secure and safer and not being hacked into, but Zoom has caused some real nightmares out there. Uh, the security hasn't been what it should be, so hang in there on that. Uh, a few things I want you to remind you of about in prayer. We have Dave Beckner. Uh, he dislocated his shoulder a couple of weeks ago and and uh, and had it reset uh, just a, yesterday, I think it was, and so he's in a sling and down for about two months. And then there's his wife, Trudy. Uh, Trudy broke her anchor, as you know, and she's down for about five months. And so those two are kind of feeling sorry for one another. Uh, there's Dave's right shoulder and Trudy's left ankle. And then, of course, Lynette Merrill, she's broken an ankle too. I don't know what's going on with all these people getting crippled, uh, including my wife. Uh, remember my wife also in prayer. She fell and whacked her knee pretty good and can hardly walk. And she's been going to Rob, our PT, and and he's really helped her and she is walking around now but and she's doing much better uh and communicating with some of our friends on uh on the, the internet she shared that with somebody and they laughed and they said oh yeah i'm always falling down she says matter of fact she says uh i think we have a new name for ourselves it's called clucks <laughs> so, so pray for these people who keep breaking bones we don't need all that I am really excited that uh, that Rob has uh, been willing to speak to us today. And of course, his title of his sermon is 
who is watching. And uh, I just praise the Lord. It's given me a, a break. Uh, usually I, I don't have to preach that much because I get to go to to uh, Ashland. And, and when I go to Ashland, I repeat one of my sermons. Uh, but that's not happening now. And so I'm really thankful. And I know I always enjoy uh, Rob's sermons. I want to just begin worship and read to you the first two verses of Psalms 92. Last night when I was looking at this, I discovered that Psalms 92 is a song for the Sabbath day. A psalm for the Sabbath day. It's a song. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your love, your blessings. And during this crisis that we're, we're all part of, I want to thank you for your protection. I want to thank you for your loving kindness. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Father, bless us continuously. And be it those that are home alone that can't see this message, Father, may you touch their hearts, give them peace, give them encouragement. And Father, I pray for these individuals that we've named and others, David, Trudy, Lynette, Ruth. Bless them, I pray, and give them comfort and healing. And I want to thank you for Rob. I want to thank you for his uh, willingness to share a message today. Bless Robin in a very special way. And as he speaks, Father, may your spirit speak through him and touch our lives. We pray and we give this all to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Good morning. What I'm preaching about today is not what I had intended. Um, I had been working on a sermon that the pastor gave me for our evangelistic series. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, he told me, well, we're not going to be doing those. We're going to be doing something else. So I started working on this sermon. And it just didn't go together. Uh, it's probably more five or six times since I first started it. And uh, I, I trust that you'll get a blessing from this. Uh, this uh, was what finally came out to me, something that uh, I needed. And I hope that it's something that uh, will be a blessing to you also. I would like to uh, begin with uh, a prayer of my own. Let's bow our heads. Father, we know that you're the creator of everything. Especially in the spring, we, we see your handiwork. Uh, we see the trees blooming, the flowers coming out of the ground. Uh, everywhere we look, we see fresh and new life. And it reminds us of you and what heaven is going to be like. We know that ultimately you're in control of everything. But right now it looks like the whole world is spinning out of control, Father. It's been a hard week for many. So many people are out of work. Uh, money is getting tight. It's hard to come together with money to pay bills in some cases. We're being separated from our family and friends in ways we never have before. Sickness and fear are becoming uh, the news every single night and it's permeating our country, Lord. Father, we ask that you put your arms around every one of your children and give them strength, give them wisdom, give them peace. Now we wanna spend some time worshiping you, Lord, and I pray that uh, my message will not be my words, but yours, that they will touch the hearts of those that are listening. Your will be done in all things, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today uh, comes from uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 2. And they watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Watching. Have you ever felt like somebody was watching you? Sometimes you look around and you see somebody watching you. Sometimes you look around and there's nobody there. And, well, why did I think somebody was watching me? Well, 
it happens more often than you think. People are watching you. And even when you don't see anybody, uh, there can be people that are watching you. As a child growing up, uh, you learn in several ways. Uh, but one of the major ways that children learn is by watching. Uh, those of you that have children, uh, you've watched your children as they tried to mimic what you did, uh, what other people in the family did, mom, dad, sister, brother, uncle, aunt, grandma, grandpa, whoever. And you see them trying to copy what they're doing, mimicking that. Have you ever heard somebody say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Or maybe uh, it runs in the family? Or like father, like son? Uh, when we say those things, what we're really saying is that children are like their parents. I'm very much like my father in many ways. And in other ways, I'm very much like my mother. Uh, I'm sure that many of you can say the same thing. Have you ever looked in the mirror and saw your mom or dad looking back at you? I have, and sometimes that's a little scary. Do you remember the number one song on the US Billboard Hot 100, December of 1974? No, I didn't either. But this song came to my mind as I was getting ready for this sermon. The title of it is, Cats in the Cradle. I don't know if you remember that rock song. It has a strange name, but it has a very powerful message. Uh, in the first verse, the father uh, is so busy that he just doesn't have time for his son. But his son says, I'm going to grow up to be just like my dad. In the second verse, the son has grown a bit. He's now in his uh, teens. He wants to play ball with the dad. Dad says, sorry, son, I'm just so busy, I can't do it. But the son still says, I want to be just like you, dad. I want to be just like you. In the first, third verse, we find the son is away at college. And... He's very busy, and, and now Dad's kind of slowed down. He's got a little more time, and uh, he wants to, to spend some time with his son, and so he, he approaches his son to spend some time with him. And the son says, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm just so busy. I, I just don't have the time. And in the last verse, the father has retired. The son has uh, got a job of his own. He's got a family, he's got children. He calls him up and uh, wants to set up a time to go and visit his son. And the son has all kinds of reasons why he doesn't have the time to do it. And uh, at the end of the song, the father says these words. He grew up just like me. And he did. He grew up just like his father, like father, like son. In the Ten Commandments, God even talks about parents and children being similar. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Basically, God is saying here that the children pick up the sins of their parents, their grandparents, and sometimes even their great and great, great grandparents. We're not exactly like our parents, but we are very much like them in habits, characteristics, both the good and the bad. It runs in the family. You remember Abraham? Uh, when he first got into Canaan, there was a famine and uh, he had to leave Canaan. He went down into Egypt and he told his wife, Say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister, that it will be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. He got in trouble because he said that. Um, he was trying 
to prevent something from happening. He didn't trust God. Uh, he's very much like we are. He makes a mistake and he does it again and again. In this case, we know of at least twice that he did that. Uh, he had Sarah tell the people wherever they went that they were brother and sister, which was really kind of a half-truth because they were half-brother and half-sister. When they came to the land of Abimelech in the kingdom of Gerar, uh, Abraham had Sarah say the same thing. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. He was going to make her one of his wives. Uh, and if it hadn't been for God's intervention, things could have gotten really, really bad. It took a long time for Abraham to learn to trust God for his safety. Now, Isaac wasn't born at the time these events took place, but he heard about them. He heard about uh, leaving Ur and Haran. Uh, he heard about the famine and the escape to Egypt. He heard about what uh, mom and dad had done to try and keep from getting in trouble, they thought. Isaac learned from his father, like father, like son. Is it surprising that because of another famine in Canaan, that when Isaac and Rebekah go to the king of the Philistines for help, that they do what Abraham and Sarah did? And this is what they said. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She's my sister, for he feared to say that she is my wife. The lie was there. They were cousins, so they were related, but uh, they were husband and wife. Um, so, who's watching you? Who is watching? Your family's watching. These are usually people that you know, your friends. Uh, your neighbors and enemies, you may know them, or you might not know them. Uh, you never know when you're going to run into somebody that you know. Sometimes you realize, realize it when it happens. Uh, sometimes you find out later about it. I know I've had a lot of people say, oh, I saw you over here, or I saw you over there, or didn't you see me? I waved at you, you know, but I didn't see them. Uh, but sometimes you don't even find out until uh, maybe never. My first teaching job was in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, the very first day that I went into the Fargo church, I walked into the foyer and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was one of my classmates from Monterey Bay Academy in California. We'd gone to school together, we graduated together. There were 93 of us in the graduating class, well, including myself, there were 94. But out of those 93 people, who would have ever guessed that I would have walked into this church almost 2,000 miles away in North Dakota of all places and bumped into one of my classmates? I was shocked, surprised. Uh, the world is smaller than we think. When I first came to this church 36 years ago, I walked into the lobby and one of the first people I saw there was another one of my classmates from Monterey Bay Academy. Uh, his daughter was in my class. I taught her for two years. Never expected that. Um, moved into a house. Um, a couple of years later, somebody moved in next door. It was one of the girls that I had graduated with from Monterey Bay Academy. And I taught two of her daughters. It's a small world. We never know when we're gonna bump into somebody that we know. Um, a number of years ago, my family, uh, we went down to Southern California for vacation. We have a lot of family at that time that lived down there. And while we were down there, we decided that we would go to Disneyland. And so we were enjoying Disneyland and uh, we're going from one attraction to another and we got into the line at the end of this one attraction and all of a sudden we realized that the family standing in front of us 
were members of our church back in the Rogue Valley. Out of the tens of thousands of people down there in Disneyland, that's who we ended up behind in line. You never know who is watching or who you might run into. Um, have you ever had the experience of somebody watching you, you knew they were watching you, but they didn't have good intentions. They wanted to cause you a problem. They wanted to get you into trouble, maybe even get you fired. I've had that happen. Uh, and it's not a very pleasant situation. You know, kind of always looking over your shoulder, you know, is somebody watching me? Why are they watching me? Um, Jesus had that experience too, many, many times. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. It seemed that everywhere Jesus went, there were people watching him, looking for something that he did or said that they could get him in trouble for. So, who's watching? Friends? Neighbors? Strangers? I mean, um, enemies? Next, we're going to talk about strangers. This is a picture of my home church that I grew up in. This is the Central Seventh-day Adventist Church in San Francisco, California. And uh, I, I went to that church for about 20 years. Um, I don't remember a church before this church. I was just a little toddler when we moved there. Um, I was baptized in this church. I was married in this church. Uh, when I think of churches, this is the first church that comes to my mind because that was, to me, my very first church. Um, the story I want to tell you happened when I was 14. Uh, it's a big church. It had lots of interesting little nooks and crannies, many stairways leading to places that most people didn't see. And being 14, I just enjoyed discovering new places in the church. I think I had been in every room in the church, uh, with the exception of the caretaker's quarters. Uh, they had an apartment in the church, and so I didn't go into their place. But I think I'd been in every other place, including I found a basement, got into that, even the attic, and got into that. Um, most of those I was okay because somebody was there or I was doing something for a reason but I was still always looking for something new. Well, on this particular Saturday night, uh, two friends of mine, uh, Norman and Marty, uh, both of them were just a year older than I was. They were 15, I was 14. Uh, we'd gone to the church Saturday night for a youth game night. And there were a lot of people there. And uh, during the time we were, we were down the, uh, with the rest of the group, uh, Marty and Norman, I don't know which of them came up with the idea, said, let's go up to the roof. I'd never been to the roof. And so I said, okay, let's go. And so the three of us managed to sneak out without anybody noticing our disappearing, worked our way up to um, the area where you had a ladder against the wall that led up to a trap door in the ceiling. And so we climbed up the ladder opened the trap door, got into a room that, if there'd been bells in the church, this would have been the bell tower. Uh, we looked around and there was another ladder going up to another trap door. So we went up that one and opened that trap door and lo and behold, we found ourselves right there on the very, very top of the church. Now, it was after dark, of course, since this was Saturday night, and we were having a great time. We were looking around at all the lights, and saw the cars going by on the street and the people walking by and stuff. And it was so cool to be up there and, and to be looking at all of these things. And, and those people didn't have the faintest idea that we were up there. And so uh, we just watched for a while. And, and then Marty 
noticed that uh, there was some gravel on the roof. They'd use that on the tar. And he picked up a few pieces of the gravel and he went and dropped one off the side of the, the church and we watched it go all the way down to the sidewalk and kind of timed it. He did that two or three more times, you know. And we continued watching. What we didn't know was that across the street in the apartment house, there was a lady that was also looking out her window. And she saw us. She was almost directly in line across the street from us. And we hadn't noticed her. We'd seen the apartment building and lots of people and lots of lights. But we hadn't noticed her watching us. Total stranger. Well, she thought that we shouldn't be up there. And, of course, she was right. Uh, so she looked in her phone book, got the number of the church, called the church, and got a hold of Mr. Card, who was the custodian of the church. And uh, she told him that there were some boys up on the roof of the church and that we were throwing rocks at passing cars. Well, that wasn't true, but from her point of view, I can see where she could have gotten that idea. Um, but anyway, it didn't take Mr. Card very long to get up to where we were and to haul us down. Um, Mom wasn't very happy with me. And uh, I actually don't remember what punishment I got, but I'm sure she did something to me um, because I know she was very, very upset uh, with my doing this. Um, but here was a stranger, somebody I had never known, and I still don't know who that person was. I just know it was a lady across the street, total stranger, but she got me into some trouble. Well, I actually got myself into the trouble, but she, she made it public. So, I'm going to take a look at a story about strangers meeting in the Bible. Uh, in Genesis 24, we have the story of Eliezer, who was a servant of Abraham. And he was given the job of going and finding a wife for Isaac. And uh, so he was sent back to Haran. And uh, he didn't know anybody back there. And uh, so he was a complete stranger. Uh, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that the women go out to draw water. Now, if you were someone looking for a wife in that day and age, this would be a good place to go because the unmarried girls, as well as uh, some of the mothers and so forth, were the ones that came out and got the water. And so he was standing out there watching these people come out of the city uh, to go over to the well to get some water. And he prayed to God that God would point out the right girl for him uh, to choose for a wife for Isaac. And he was very specific about it. He said, I want her to volunteer to water my camels. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how many girls he asked for a drink. He may have asked several before he got to Rebecca. But when he asked Rebecca, Rebecca gave him a drink and then she volunteered to water all of his camels. Now, she didn't realize that this stranger was looking for a wife for his master's son. She didn't realize that this man was going to change her life completely forever. He was just a stranger looking for a drink of water and she volunteered to water his camels. Now, I don't know if you know much about camels, but uh, a thirsty camel can drink up to 30 gallons of water in a very short period of time. And Eliezer had 10 camels with him. That's 300 gallons of water if these camels were thirsty. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But that's a possibility. Do you know how much 300 gallons of water weighs? 2,500 pounds. That's a lot of water to pull out of a well and to carry over to a trough and dump into this trough for camels to drink. Eliezer knew that. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely 
to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. He was dumbfounded. He couldn't believe it. He's standing there watching her back and forth, back and forth, bringing water, water, water for those camels. And he realized this is a miracle. It really was. One day, Jesus and his disciples went to the temple. Uh, while they were at the temple, they went over to the location where the offerings were put. They had a box there. People would come in. They would put their money into this box. And uh, a lot of people would come in with lots of money, make a big show of pouring their money into the box, letting everybody see what they're doing. And they go, oh my, look at how much they put in. And Jesus' disciples were doing that. They were looking at these guys. And, but they really weren't seeing what Jesus was seeing. The disciples were impressed by these people that had lots of money. But Jesus wasn't. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. That's what impressed the disciples. But Jesus wasn't impressed until there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. This poor widow came in. Now, I'm sure she didn't wake up that morning thinking, well, I'm gonna go over to the temple and I'm gonna put my money into the treasury and uh, the people are gonna be watching me and they're gonna see me and you know, it's gonna be good for my you know, self-esteem. And... No, she probably waited until most of the people were gone, there was nobody there, and just quietly went over and very quietly put her two mites in. Disciples didn't notice, really, until Jesus made a comment. Jesus called his disciples, and he saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast in the treasury. I'm sure the disciples at this point are thinking, what? That, that tiny little, less than a penny that she put in there. And Jesus is saying that's worth more than all of these vast treasures, these thousands and thousands of dollars that these other people have put in there. And Jesus went on, he said, for all they did cast in of their abundance. He said, they put in money, didn't hurt them. They had lots of money. So putting this money into the treasury didn't hurt them a bit. They probably didn't even notice it as far as their bank account was concerned. But she, on the other hand, of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. She gave everything. She gave everything. And that's what Jesus noticed. That impressed Jesus. She didn't know who Jesus was, probably. She didn't see him over there. Um, and she didn't realize that this act of hers, putting in that tiny little bit of money, was something that was going to be repeated to millions and millions and millions of people over 2,000 years were still talking about the gift that she gave that day that probably nobody else noticed, but Jesus did. So who's watching? Strangers are watching you. Government. I don't know if you've ever heard of Eric Arthur Blaine. He was an English writer. Uh, he wrote books in the late, mid and late 1940s. And one that he published near the end of the 1940s, 1949, was about government. Uh, it was a book of fiction. But interestingly enough, uh, many of the things that he wrote about are happening today and have happened. Uh, you may know him by another name though. Uh, his pen name was George Orwell. 
Uh, you may have even heard of a couple of the books that he's written. One of them is Animal Farm. Um, most of us uh, have read Animal Farm, probably in school. Many schools require that. Uh, very interesting book. But that's not the book that I'm talking about. The book I'm talking about is the book titled 1984. Uh, that was published in 1949, uh, shortly after World War II. Uh, what inspired him to write that book was watching the world, watching communism, fascism, and all of the things that were going on in Europe. Uh, because remember, he was an English um, writer, and so he was involved in all of that. And so that was the basis, and he started looking at big government. And uh, uh, you're probably uh, uh, familiar with some of these phrases that he coined in his book. Uh, things like news speak, double think, unperson, thought crime, thought police. And probably the one that's most famous of all is Big Brother is watching you. Those are all words that he coined in his book. And uh, we see a lot of that today. In his book, he has cameras everywhere watching everything that everybody does. Uh, the cameras in his day he called telescreens. Telescreens. Uh, Jesus tells us that we're supposed to respect the government at least up to a point. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that be Caesar's, and unto God the things that be God's. Do you know what these are? They're cameras, but they're a special type of camera. There are three of them mounted on this pole here, pointed in three different directions. These are called L, uh, ALPRs. ALPR stands for Automatic License Plate Readers. Now, I don't know um, if you've ever driven on the interstate through a place that has toll roads. They used to have toll booths to stop people on those roads to pay the toll. Those have pretty much disappeared now. Most people that travel on those um, have an account with the, the, the state or the city, whoever owns the road, and, and as they go by, it records their plate number and deducts from their account the amount of money for that particular trip. Um, I've been on a couple of those, and uh, of course, there was no place to pay at the time, and I didn't have a, uh, an account with them, so guess what I got? I got a little notice in my mail saying, you were here at this particular time and you owe us this much money. Well, these scanners are pretty fantastic. Um, they can record a picture of the license plate, uh, the vehicle itself, the driver of the vehicle, Frequently, the passengers of the vehicle, it will record the location, the time of day, the direction of your travel, and even your speed. All of that information can be done in just an instant. Um, they can be mounted almost anywhere on anything. Some of them are mounted on poles like these. Others are mounted on uh, vehicles. Uh, they can capture up to 2,000 license plates in a minute in one minute. And they can catch license plates on vehicles traveling up to at least 120 miles an hour. So you can't drive fast enough generally to not be read. You're gonna get caught. Uh, in 2017, there were just 300 of these cameras in the US, according to the site that I went to. Uh, and uh, to last year, 2019, that had gone up to over 9,000 cameras. Uh, at least 16 states have statutes regarding how these can be used. And uh, just to let you know, I know there's one here in the Rogue Valley because he stopped me six years ago. 
uh, I wasn't really doing anything bad. Um, uh, and I was surprised that he saw me because I was in traffic and he was going the opposite direction from me. But the instant I passed him, I, I saw in my side view mirror, he immediately put his brakes on. And in my rear view mirror, I saw him make a, a U-turn in the middle of the street and come after me. Then, okay, how did he know? Well, to, to tell you the, the background of this, I had an old car that still fell under the, within the 20 years of the INM here in the valley, and it just wouldn't pass INM. I kept having work done on it, and it, I'd take it in, and, and I'd been into the INM three or four times, and it still wouldn't pass the INM inspection. And this happened to be uh, the uh, next to the last time that I took it to INM. And uh, I was driving it, of course, the tags were expired at this point in time, and that's what he caught, was that my tags were expired. And so he pulled me over for that. I showed him, you know, the, the paper I had from the INM and, and the bills that I had paid for the repairs that I was doing on the car. And uh, he was gracious enough to say, okay, well, you're trying to solve the problem, thank you. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you, how did you know? He says, well, I've got a, a license plate reader on my vehicle. He says, it happens to be the only one in the valley right now. And I happened to run into him. But uh, they're out there, folks. They're reading your plates. Um, I forget what it... Um, oh, I, won't, I won't go into that. I was, I've been reading a lot about these readers, but uh, they're out there. Um, also, you may have seen these types of things. Uh, cameras. Now, in 2019, in the United States, there were counted uh, uh, over 50 million cameras in this country that are out there watching. 50 million. That's one camera for every seven people in the country. They're everywhere, people. Everywhere. And they're watching you. They're watching me. In fact, on an average day, uh, of course, during our uh, period of time right now where we're trying to stay home and so forth, it isn't probably true, but on an average day, you will be on a camera 75 times. On the average day, the average American is on a camera 75 times. But you know, we're not the worst. Uh, there are other countries that, that have more. Uh, if you were living in the United Kingdom, on an average day, you'd be on a camera 300 times. They can watch everything you do. They know everywhere we go. It's amazing. So who's watching? Big Brother's watching. You better believe it. And, and those are just a couple of things. You know, I haven't gone into GPS locators, uh, your cell phones, your computers, any of that stuff. You know, uh, Big Brother's watching. Big Brother's watching. Angels. Now, up to this point in time, I've been talking about other humans watching humans. Uh, but if you believe the Bible like I do, then you realize that there are other beings out there that aren't human that are watching us. This is Jacob when he's fleeing uh, because of his lie to his father and he stay, stops to sleep and he dreamed to behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending it. He got a picture of the traffic between heaven and earth. The angels are constantly coming and going. They're watching us. And the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. We believe we all have a guardian angel. That angel follows us everywhere we go and sees everything we do. And if you believe that God has sent a guardian angel to watch over you and to protect you, 
then you probably believe that Satan has one of his angels out there that's watching you, trying to get you to do things that you shouldn't, trying to hurt you. So there's a, there's a lot of beings out there that we can't see normally that are watching everything we do and say. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. So who's watching us? Angels are watching us, both good and bad. Last, but certainly not least, is God. Solomon tells us probably all we need to know about God's interest in us. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's with me right now here, and he's with you wherever you may be. He's everywhere. So who's watching? God is watching. There's a, an old hymn that goes like this. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got everybody in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, 1975, I lived in Fargo, North Dakota. There was an evangelist that came to our area, and I don't even remember his name. Uh, I know it was an evangelistic series with all of the normal evangelistic uh, topics that you have, but what stuck with me more than anything else, and I've remembered it many, many times in the years since, and when I started putting this together, it came back to my mind again, was the title of his series. The title of his series was Theater of the Universe. And the idea behind that was that this earth is being watched by the entire universe. We're being watched not only by each other, not only by the angels, by God, but also by beings on other planets. They're watching to see what we're going to do to see what happens with this world. They watched this God himself become a person born on this planet, to live on this planet, to be pestered by Satan's angels, to be hounded by other people, until finally they nailed him to a cross. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Someday very soon, he's coming back. And we're not going to have to worry about a lot of those watchers anymore. He's going to come to take his own back with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much that you love us so very much. We know that you love us because you came and became one of us. You lived and you died and you rose again. You're in heaven right now planning a place for us to go. And we know very soon you're coming back to take us home. And Lord, we want to be ready. We're watching. We're waiting. We know that you are anxious to come and return. And we are anxious for you to return. So we pray that you will bless us. Keep us safe. Put your arms around us and hold us in your love until that day when you come and take us all back to heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, and your will be done in all things.
Amen.